Good morning. In today's video, I'll talk about the recent Maldives fiasco. I do not wish to dwell upon the national hysteria fully supported by the ministers and the celebrities which got generated over Maldives. But I wish to draw attention to a very important aspect of this event. And that is, why is it that Maldives, a small nation, which has traditionally been in India's area of influence and which is just 700 kilometers away from the Indian city of Kochi, chose China over India. China, whose closest port from Maldives is 6,000 kilometers away. And the answer is because even smaller nations understand they are coming to grips with the new world order and the drivers of the new world order. So what I intend to do first is talk about the drivers of this new world order and then to see the place that India and China have in the new world order to fully understand the Maldives phenomena. Now there are two drivers of this new world order. One is the rise of China and the second is the rise of the global south fully supported by China and Russia and India has very little to do in this. Let me start with the rise of China. China presents a dichotomy of sorts. On the one hand, it has many areas of brilliance, not one but many areas of brilliance and on the other hand, it is actually a developing nation. So let me start by saying something that everybody knows. It is the second largest economy in the world. The economy is $19 trillion. The first economy, the leading economy is America with something close to $23 trillion. And India has an economy of $3.79 trillion in comparison. Now, Let's look at the areas of brilliance that where China has leapfrogged, where China is far ahead of America. Number one is China is the largest industrial manufacturing hub of the world. 33% of world manufacturing is still done in China. There is hardly anything that China does not manufacture. In comparison to China, India's contribution to global manufacturing is a mere 4%. Because of this massive manufacturing that happens in China, it is an indispensable partner in all the global supply chains. Therefore, all this talk which has been going on for the last 3-4 years of decoupling and de-risking spoken by the Americans and the EU nations, in my opinion, is a myth. Because even today, if you see, the trade between the bilateral trade of America and China is $700 billion. And the bilateral trade of India and China, despite our relations being at the lowest since 62 war, stands at 135 billion dollars with 90 billion dollars in favor of China. Because of its massive manufacturing, China is the largest trading nation in the world. Of the 195 nations in the world, it is the primary trading partner of 98 nations. It is the largest shipbuilding nation in the world. In terms of tonnage, it has the largest naval fleet. China has the largest road network. China has the largest rail network in the world. It has high speed rails, rails of speeds of 300 km an hour, 400 km an hour and now 450 km an hour. And last year, it demonstrated the capability of a magnetic levitation train. That is a train that does not run on the tracks but above the tracks. So that the friction does not come into play and they demonstrated this train to run at 600 kilometers an hour and they are working on this and they say that by 2025 they will have six such trains running in China. 
then china is a acknowledged leader in international infrastructure building in so far as green development is concerned china is a leader in electric vehicle it is a leader in solar solar and wind panels and it is a leader leader in lithium ion batteries and sodium ion batteries sodium ion batteries can give the same result as the lithium ion battery but they are much cheaper china is also the largest commercial drones manufacturer it is the largest internet consumer in 2014 itself it had a mobile economy there was hardly any paper being used in its economy then in 2016 china sent its first quantum satellite called mozi in space and recently it has demonstrated using the quantum key distribution the quantum communication between russia and china a distance of 4000 kilometers and now china says it is planning and working on a quantum communication network which will cover both the high orbit as well as the low earth orbit then china is a leader in the 5g rollout china competes with america in two basic technologies of technologies which is artificial intelligence and biotechnology it is competing in all the six stacks stacks of artificial intelligence so the question is how was this possible it is because and they do not hide this the chinese chinese first announced their program in 2015 which is called made in china where they said that these 15 technologies they will put emphasis upon the new age technologies and they did that now we know in 2022 america came out in august of that year the american president signed what is called the chips and science act where something like 24 billion dollars have been put set aside for the act the fact of the matter is that since 2015 every year china has been investing this sort of money in those 10 technologies that it wanted to do then suddenly the americans got worried when china came out in 2017 with its new generation artificial intelligence development plan and it said that by 2013 30 2030 china will become an artificial intelligence one of the major powers in the world so what did the americans do now the americans said instead of competing with china which they claim that they are competing they are actually trying to contain china they are trying to contain china by tariffs by sanctions by denying china the high end chips and i don't think it will work because it has never worked if you ask any expert who has worked closely on china it has never worked in their case because when they decide on the areas as of excellence they put their energy they make their right policies and they put their money there so this is one china now the other china which the americans by the containment policy are trying to uh, stop or contain is that china is still a developing nation although it has pulled out 800 million people out of abject poverty the fact of the matter is that even today those 800 million people they have they live on 300 to 400 us dollars in a month which is a small amount compared to the developed world so what they have now done is that xi jinping the president he came out with his 15th plan and in the 15th plan and this is why we are seeing today as the experts tell us the real experts they tell us that in this 15th plan obviously there is a major transformation that is happening structural changes are being done in the chinese economy from the real estate from the low end manufacturing from the consumer technology platforms which was their mobile economy now they are shifting to the technology enabled industrial internet and supply chains 
which is about use of artificial intelligence, use of biotechnology, use of all the new age technologies. And they are also, they are putting the money in the new energy industries. The big example of that is the electric vehicles where today they are the world leader. And this is what the fourth industrial revolution is about. And this is what is wor- this is what worries the Americans. The Americans want to contain them because they are worried. The Chinese have already rolled out the 5G, which is the backbone of the fourth industrial revolution. And they are likely to leapfrog if they are not contained. So this is about the rise of China. China has basically disturbed the entire balance. A balance which used to be in the balance of power, in uh, you know, uh, which was then in the European theater. Now it has all come to the Asia Pacific region. And mind you, in all this, the Americans and many analysts in India they say that the Chinese are putting a lot of money in their defense. Of course, they are putting the money. They are putting the money because whenever a nation becomes prosperous, it is incumbent on the nation. to make sure that its infrastructure its 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 interest and its people outside the country they are safe they have to be protected and especially in the case of china because it has already rolled out its belt and road initiative and the second reason of course is that the nation has to prepare its military for deterrence purposes it is not that i am trying to speak on behalf of china i am just giving out the facts as they are and the second reason is in this rise of china there is no ideology involved and if anything the chinese president himself has spoken about last year about what is called the global civilizational initiative that means all countries whether it is india whether it is china or any other nation with a civilization or whatever the traditions and culture no other country has a business to interfere in their uh, ideology so it's a very clear thing that the chinese have done now the second thing as i said the driver is the rise of the global south when we talk of global south we are talking of latin america in latin america we are talking of central and south america and the caribbean islands we are talking of the african continent we are talking of asia minus 3 nations in global south and they are israel japan and south korea and we are talking of oceania nations 12 nations minus australia and new zealand this is the global south when you see global south it is many more countries than the g7 the global north now what is it here here are the key drivers behind this global south the rise of global south are both china and russia china perhaps more because it came up and it has the money it has the deep pockets 10 years ago with the belt and road initiative on the belt and road initiative you know the first phase was about the physical belt and the physical road in the sense that physical infrastructure had to be built the ports the railways the power houses the electricity generation all these things were done in phase 1 now phase 2 which started sometimes in 2017 is what is called the digital silk road this is about hard and soft cyber space cyber space connectivity in the hard cyber space connectivity we know it is about fiber optic cables china today is a leader in this it is a leader in the sub sea cables today and then it is a leader it has the third element of this is the betu constellation 45 satellites which is today global and it is giving world class resolutions so this is about the hard cyber space connectivity and the soft cyber space connectivity as we know it's about the industrial internet and that will come now as far as the russians are concerned the two countries the two big powers russia and china they have come up with a joint vision and the joint vision which started very early because president putin in 2012 itself he spoke about his vision which was about eu which is the eurasia economic union 
uh, yeah, Eurasia Economic Union. And the two leaders decided, Xi Jinping and Putin, how do we bring them together? And of course, now Putin has further refined the EEU into greater Eurasia, where now he includes the ASEAN, he includes India, Pakistan and the Middle East. So this is the vision that the two leaders, they had decided on. Now, another part of this vision is the northern sea route of the Russians which is where both the nations, China and Russia, they are working there and are also working to develop Russia's Far East. So, when people say, when analysts say that, look, these two nations have come in a tight embrace because of the Ukraine war, they are actually not correct because the vision came much earlier. Two things that they have in common and they are strategic in nature, both the things. One is their common vision and the second is their dislike for the American hegemony, for the American military dominance of the world. Now, what the Ukraine war did was, it did two additional things. The first was, and this is something which will be remembered as a pivotal moment, which was the 15th BRICS summit held in August last year, Johannesburg in South Africa. BRICS was, 15th BRICS was an exceptional event for the simple reason that it saw of the 54 African nations, 52 nations were there as invitees. The entire SEO nations were there as invitees and it was decided there and it's already happened starting 1st of January. Five new members have joined in. Today there are 10 members of BRICS, but more than 10 members. BRICS has a BRICS bank which is called the New Development Bank. Then there is also a Silk Fund, a Silk Root Fund. This, these are the two things which will be funding the countries of the Global South, their projects, which help them in their development. And today, these are the figures being given out that the 10 BRICS nation GDP far exceeds the GDP of the G7 nation, the industrialized nations. So this is one thing that has happened and now this year, the presidency of BRICS has gone to Russia. President Putin has already given his initial remarks where he says that something like 25 nations are willing to come and join BRICS. The amazing thing about BRICS is that the global gas and oil suppliers, importers and exporters, they both are part of this BRICS. They are BRICS members and the most important thing, people are talking of de-dollarization. Now, I won't say that and everybody agrees that the dollar, which is the reserve currency of the world, will not get replaced anytime soon. But the idea is to displace it. You displace it by local trade, by local currency, by digital currency. And this is what is happening. Agreements have been signed between Iran and Russia between Saudi Arabia and China to trade now in local currency and yuan obviously has emerged as a very important and an interesting currency that all the most of the BRICS member they want to use as the alternate reserve currency. India of course is not happy with this. India did a, an agreement with 22 nations to see if the rupee could also be um, the exchange currency but the reports that are coming out is that not a single nation has accepted India, including Russia, as a reserve currency. They do not want to deal with rupee for the simple reason, and these are this is all reality, that in relation to dollar, the value of the rupee has dipped a lot. And nobody wants to keep that money. So yuan is the currency for the time being, which is being most used in addition to rubles, in addition to the other currencies of the Middle East. And another interesting thing of this BRICS is that Pakistan has applied for BRICS membership. And I see all reasons 
that it will be supported the membership will get supported by the two big powers which is china and russia and india already has given the first indications that look we are here talking of emerging markets coming in brics and pakistan is not one of them i am not sure how long for how 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 further the indian cloud will work in the brics though we know that brics works by consensus so one is this de dollarization which is going on in the brics and the second aspect is that as a consequence of the ukraine war the russians have come to the conclusion that since two third of russia is in asia that a lot of their military power needs to now come towards asia in 2023 we saw joint operations between china and russia in the east china sea and in the far east in the northern sea areas i'm saying joint operations i'm not saying exercises joint operation is a well enhanced mode it is close to real war than a exercise as far as exercises is concerned we know in 2023 the russians did exercise with the myanmar navy in the sea of andaman with iran russia the 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 trilateral of iran russia and china was held in the gulf of oman and we also had a trilateral of russia china and saudi arabia in the indian ocean region the point that i am make trying to make is that we will see more and more of russian power military power come to the indian ocean region and exercising there with the chinese and this could happen in 2023 the whole idea in my assessment is that these two big powers they will work together to secure the sea lanes of communications against the americans and the western parts pass right through the entire indian ocean region starting from the strait of hormuz to the strait of malacca because after all the chinese have something like a 4 trillion dollar commercial trade passing annually through this through this entire stretch which is 3000 nautical miles so what we are seeing now in to, in in sum what we are seeing is that on the one hand the military power of the americans which is their real strength because after all the americans have today 800 military bases in the world now that is being tampered by something entirely different the world has not seen before which is by the offerings of connectivity and development by china fully supported by russia to the global south nations and the second strength of the americans is their dollar we are already seeing that the dollar is being displaced by the use of local currencies and this is something which will keep gaining momentum in the years to come now where does india fit in all this now once we understand this the next thing to understand is that look in the emerging order you have three great powers and those three great powers are russia china and america when i say great powers they are, what this means is they have the capability capacity and the political will to influence events way beyond their borders and how do you influence the events you influence by use of nations which are pivots which are called geopolitical pivots so what we have is a great power what you have is a major power countries like south korea countries like japan germany france they are the major powers and then you have the pivots so the reality is that india today in a world which is which appears to be multipolar but i would argue is actually becoming more and more bipolar bipolar in the sense that there is a block which is the global north where we have the g7 led by america and the global south which is what i said the developing the less developed nations which is led by or which is supported fully by the by china and russia so these are the two blocks and where does india fit in india provides a unique opportunity 
in the Asia Pacific region because of two big reasons. And those two big reasons and that is what makes it a very valuable or a major geopolitical pivot in the region are its location. It sits astride this entire Indian Ocean region. It is a location that both want, the, the global north want, wants because if they are, because after all this is one area as I said from Malacca to Hormoz that the trade of the Russians, the trade of the Chinese, the commercial trade will be most vulnerable. So the global north also wants that. And the global south also wants India because of its location and because India today is a partner, it's a founding partner of BRICS. So both China and Russia want India to be there. So location is one. Second is India has a huge market. And India has a promise, it has a potential provided it can get its geopolitics, its international relations right. Now, as far as the G7 is concerned, there are additional benefits that they have. And that is, India has problems on its borders. It has live borders. So, it needs and it does not have, despite the talk of this Atmanirbar or Make in India and Defence, the fact of the matter is that it is the, still the largest importer of arms in the world. And the Americans in the West, they want to sell and they are selling arms and ammunition to India. And then, as far as uh, the perhaps the most important reason is, conceptual reason is that the Modi government has decided that it wants to be seen to be competing with China, notwithstanding the fact, as I said, that China is a great power. And how do you compete with China? You compete with China by not talking with China, by creating an alternate reality and basically trying to balance China, balance your power with the help of the West and the Americans. But this is something which I can talk in another video. So the closeness that the Modi government has or it has developed in the last five to six years, especially after June 2020 Galwan killings which happened on the border, Indo-China border. So that is noteworthy. But here what I want to talk is about the neighborhood. Now neighborhood is, uh, is, is, is something that the Modi government very early, as early as 2014 when it came to office, they decided that this should be the focus of their government. And even today they claim this is the focus. So when we talk of this, we have seen Maldives because Maldives has realized that China today, because Chinese Belt and Road, except for India and Bhutan, all these smaller nations of the Indian subcontinent, all nations are on board the BRI, that they can get more help from China than they can get from India. Because China will not interfere at all in their internal affairs or it will be very minimal which is not the case when we talk of India because traditionally India has seen itself as the boss of the Indian subcontinent and that mindset is not going away. The mindset of our envoys not being envoys to the nations but behaving like viceroys. So that is not going away. So. This is precisely what we have seen and the next country where the problem will come is Bhutan. Bhutan has just had finished the election, they have got the new Prime Minister. In last September, September 2023, King of Bhutan was invited to India. He met up with Prime Minister Modi. As we know, the King of Bhutan is to be the Defence Minister of Bhutan. And we know what is going on between China and Bhutan. All the satellite pictures say, they, they show that the Chinese are putting a lot of pressure on the Bhutanese that all right, now your elections are over, let's resolve the border. I see no reason why the Bhutanese wouldn't want to resolve their border. 
perhaps the king was called here to to tell them to to tell the king this is my guess that the army training team the army training team which has been there in bhutan since 1963 should not come back any time soon to india once the border between bhutan and china has resolved and obviously then bhutan will be also on board the bri it should not come back like maldives is saying that you please take all your military personnel some 75 of them back we do not want any military personnel on our soil so bhutan perhaps will be the next country our relations with nepal are no, not good bangladesh also the leader has come in the first fifth term i mean i don't have to dwell on that if you see their entire military inventory the bangladeshi inventory it is all chinese so where eventually bangladesh will go i mean after all there also the people understand the evolving global order it is all very obvious so what are we talking about pakistan we don't talk and pakistan by the way is a formidable nation in military terms so pakistan is not with us maldives has decided to go away bhutan is likely to go away soon then nepal and then you have bangladesh well they are more or less we have problems with nepal so the long and short is we have to india needs to seriously think why its neighborhood policy which has been its consistent focus since 2014 is not working instead of creating a mass hysteria over maldives thank you so much